if you can follow that much, you say, what do clocks measure? Clocks measure proper time. Then I can give you an analogy that completely explains the twins' paradox, why it's not a paradox. You say, look, here's an analogy. It's going to be a really good one. In a car, we have an odometer. What does an odometer measure? Odometer measures, in some sense, the length of the, of the path that the car took. Right? If we set the odometer to zero, and later it reads some larger number, and the numbers will always go up, what's it measuring? It's measuring the length of the, of the path it took from where I started to here. So I take two cars, identical cars, identical makes, set their odometers to zero, sitting side by side. And, I, and, and then a few hours later, the cars are back together side by side. And I look at the odometers. You say, wait, wait, this one has more, this one's higher than that one. And you say, yeah, what's the, what's the problem here? This one, you know, the one with less took the highway, shorter route. The one with more took a scenic route, longer path. The odometers are just measuring these paths. They start out together, they end up different because they took different paths. That's not a paradox, right? Now, just apply that to proper time. Clocks measure proper time. They're measuring the lengths along these paths. I start out with two clocks side by side. I synchronize them. The two twins now, we've got you know, twin A and B. One of them, for example, just hangs out on Earth, so their trajectory through space-time might be this, or you know, this, I mean, whatever it's doing. The other one gets into a rocket, takes a very different trajectory through space-time. It kind of goes way over here and comes back and blah, blah, blah. They get back together. Their clocks have different readings. That's not a shock. They took different paths through space-time. The paths had different lengths. The only thing that should shock you about that, should shock your intuitions, is that in, in the case of Euclidean geometry, which is the analogy I'm trying to give you to the, to the uh, odometers, if I had two paths in Euclidean space and one did sort of direct this here and the other one went the scenic route, the scenic route would be longer. It gets flipped over in relativity. The, the as it were, direct route, the straight route is the shortest is the longest one, sorry. It's the longest one. And the one that does this will be shorter. That is, this twin will be older than this twin. That's kind of funny, and you can sort of see all of that arises in a very natural way, because one way to get at the geometry of special relativity is to take Euclidean geometry that we're all familiar with, where you've got uh, the distance is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, you know, th this kind of thing that people are familiar with. And you just take a bunch of those pluses and turn them into minuses, not all of them, but you leave one plus and the other's minus. So the distance is the square root of the difference in t squared minus the difference in x squared minus it. So you kind of flip a, a plus to a minus, and that takes paths of minimal length to paths of maximal length. There's kind of very systematic mapping uh, it's an inversion, in a way, between the geometry, Minkowski geometry, and Euclidean geometry. But once you kind of flip that over in your head, again, conceptually, again, I haven't given you any equations or anything, but just conceptually, you say, what clocks are measuring are the lengths of these lines? If I start out with two clocks together and they get back together later, I can compare them side by side. The one that has run off more time is the one that took the longer path. And then all you need to know is that the longest path is unaccelerated. So if somebody's been just sitting there unaccelerated, they've taken the longest path. They should, they should have clicked off the most time. That's why the stay-at-home twin in the normal twins example is older, right? The twin that goes out and comes back and, it, and, and it has taken this long route around or, or this, I'm sorry, this other route around is actually a shorter route around. So that's the correct explanation. Now, what does Feynman do wrong? Feynman says, oh, there's this puzzle. Here's the puzzle about the twins paradox. And I'm going to state what he says the puzzle is, and you'll see immediately he was wrong in the statement. And then he's wrong in the, in the resolution. So he says, somebody's going to say, but this is weird. I mean, I have these two twins. 
One's, one's on Earth, the other is in a rocket, goes out, comes back, is younger. Then somebody says, but wait, the relative motions of the two, that's symmetric. If A is moving relative to B, then just as much B is moving relative to A, right? Relative motions are, as it were, necessarily symmetric. So if everything is explained by relative motion, how could one end up older than the other? Why isn't it a perfectly symmetric situation? That's the puzzle as, as Feynman puts it. To which the answer is, relativity doesn't run on relative motion. You've already made a mistake, right? Your puzzle is based on a mistake. Your puzzle is based on the thought that the only real physical quantities in relativity are relational quantities between bodies. They're not. This, again, this is true independently, even if there's only one clock in the universe. So there are no other clocks or no other anythings. It's gonna travel on a trajectory through space-time and it's ticking, if it's a well-made clock, will reflect the length of that path, even if there are no other paths. So Feynman sets it up wrong. He sets it up, well, what is the physical difference between twin A and twin B, such that twin B ends up younger than twin A? And then his resolution is wrong. He says, oh, the difference is that twin, a is uh, twin B is accelerated and twin A is unaccelerated. And that's wrong too, because you can just set up situations where the more accelerated twin has the longer amount of time or the shorter amount of time or anything you want. There's really no fundamental distinction, there's no fundamental connection in the physics between the amount of acceleration and the readings of the clocks. And you can just show that. I mean, if anybody's interested in my book on space and time, it's very easy to see in these diagrams. Acceleration, I mean, the conceptual, here's the conceptual point. Acceleration has to do with how straight or bent one of these trajectories is. But clocks don't care how straight or bent they are any more than your odometer cares how much you're turning the wheel, right? What an odometer measures is length. And length is a different quantity than bentness. Acceleration corresponds to bentness. Proper time corresponds to length. So Feynman thinks he's gonna solve this problem which is ill-stated at the beginning and then to solve it, he mentions acceleration which is the wrong solution anyway. <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't work. Even technically it doesn't work. The right thing to say is, no, this is not a, it's not a theory where everything is relative. It's a theory where there is an absolute space-time structure, and what clocks read depends upon the trajectory of a, a the, the nature of a trajectory through space-time given that structure. Um, if you don't understand that, it's hopeless. Now, the, the, the irony is, if we, again, maybe we'll do another one on general relativity. Feynman gives a beautiful example, concrete example in general relativity that shows he understands that theory right on, right? And, and if we get there, it's a wonderful example. It's like, it's, one, it's a puzzle, and you're, I'm sure you're familiar with this. It's a puzzle that if you think about it one way, it sounds very complicated. And to solve it, you need to do a kind of complicated calculation. But if you think about it another way, it's trivial and you can answer it like that, right? It's one of those cases where, yeah, shut up and calculate will get you there. But if you've got to get the answer by doing the calculation, you didn't understand the problem. Because just if you plug in the fundamental concepts, the answer immediately appears. So, and, and that's why, I, I think that's part of what people loved about Feynman. He did care about this. He did care about having not equations and just, oh, here are some equations, now learn some math. Here's how to think about what's going on. He always wanted a concrete picture in his head, as it were, that he could think about before he did the calculations. He understood that the calculations aren't the, aren't the key to understanding. You have to understand what you're calculating and why. And sometimes when you do that, you don't even have to do the calculation. It's just he made some mistakes, right? And it's not surprising. He made the same mistakes that everybody makes, made about relativity, thinking it's a relational theory, thinking that, you know, I mean, it, it, 
Minkowski space-time is just as absolute and non-relational as Newtonian absolute space and time. They just have different structures. They have different geometries. But in terms of, is one more absolute than the other? No, they're, they're, they're on the same plane. They just they're just different geometrically. <laughs>